Now the overarching concept of our conversation as we begin this evening is manhood. It's not an easy subject. It's something that the world is grasping with. It's something that the church is grasping with. It's something that the African, average African man is also grasping with. Let me explain what I say. The Bible says that for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall be one. But the average African man reads that to mean for this cause shall his wife leave his her father and her mother and the two shall be one. How many people see the scripture that way? It's not the man living, it's the woman living. Ideally, therefore, in practical terms, you ought to be closer to the family of your wife than you are to the closer of the, to your family. So once you marry, you are supposed to adopt the family of your wife because what God does is that for the loss of the name that their daughter suffers, they gain a son. So the equation is balanced. And so you have to understand that because the concept of the African man is a very flawed concept. It is a man who can take advice from his wife, can't listen, can't display affection, is never discouraged, can't grieve over loss, can't play with his kids, rules his own by fiat, is very controlling and dictatorial, can't do domestic chores, can't beat the children, can't do home work with his kids, loves English Premier League and uh, possibly Arsenal. <laughs> he can't attend parent teacher association. In other words, the way the African defines man is a man who is primed for divorce. When last did you tell your wife, I love you, baby? If baby is too carnal, maybe you can say, I love you, shalom. <laughs> when last did you tell your son or daughter, daddy loves you? The template you have parented that you have is from your father, who was never told, I love you, by his father, whose father never told, was never told that he loves him. So you carry that forward instead of obeying the word of God and being vulnerable, because being vulnerable is part of manhood. You become sclerotic, and therefore you can't express as perfection. And therefore your marriage is dry. There's a limit to which dutifulness can carry marriage. What makes marriage very beautiful is friendship. When there's no friendship, marriage is not sweet. It's not about sex, it's not about vigor, because you are going to get to an age in which sex doesn't mean anything. And I'm not talking about when you are 80 or when you are 90, in your 50s. It's no big deal. I mean, if you are not yet 50 yet, you won't understand what I'm saying. Now, if we accept that Jesus is the ultimate definition of manhood, then we must study why the world calls him a man, because the world called him a man. When Pontius Pilate has caught him, he presented him to the crowd and said in Latin, A.K. Homo, behold the man. And he wasn't the first only person who pronounced Jesus the man. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, after they had spoken, the, the woman went to her and said, Come everybody, come and listen. I have seen a man. In other words, the two theaters of manhood are government and the secular world and the sorority of womanhood. If the two cannot declare you a man, you are not a man. Are you listening to me? Why did the woman call Jesus a man? For the first time, that woman met a man who respected her beyond sexuality because she had a bad taste in men. She was married five times, so she kept on making mistakes. She thought her name was Elizabeth Taylor. And then she beat Jesus and they don't talk about sexuality, they don't talk about our mistakes, they don't talk about our vulnerability, they begin to talk archaeology, history, and, 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 and theology. For the first time, she's meeting someone who engages our senses. And you don't know what that means, because I know. I remember when I met my wife, and we discussed. I didn't know she was studying me. And years after, she told me I was the first man in the private sector that she met, who didn't proposition her, who didn't ask her for sex, who didn't ask her for date. And she was just amazed. You got to move beyond sexuality. 
Therefore, a man is one who respects women, has forbearance, pursues a vision, accesses his purpose, and makes sacrifices. Because that is the major of the definition of manhood by both Jesus and the Samaritan woman. This brings us to the topic of our deliberation today, vision, purpose. I've renamed the title Vision, Purpose, and Vitamins. Never mind the vitamins. I added it in as a title because Mrs. Alder makes sure that I think vitamins A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. As you very well know, I'm a brand strategy consultant. In that capacity, I have done strategy sessions helping corporations define what we technically refer to as the spiritual dimensions of an organization. By spiritual dimensions, we mean the vision, the mission, the values, the culture, and the personality of the organization, things that you can't touch. That's what we mean by spiritual dimensions. Now, because the modern corporation is a relatively modern invention, I began to search in the Bible, and I asked myself, is it possible that the concept of vision statements as we know it today, does it exist in the Bible? I searched and searched, and then I came across the business advice of Pastor James. This is what he wrote. And now I have a word for you who brashly announced, today at the least tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for the year. We're going to start a business and make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You are nothing but a wisp of fog, catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills it, we, and we are still alive, we will do this and that. What James is saying is that when you have a vision for your corporation, you are going to open a new headquarters in a new country. You are expanding and starting all those divisions in other countries. Don't say with certainty that we're going to do this and this and this. There's a dependency. And that dependency is the will of God. Because if it takes you that night, that vision is dead. When a man is dead, the vision is dead. And that's what Satan does. He kills you before you die. So that your vision will die. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over the spirit of discouragement. I take political control of this atmosphere. I command the ethos of God to permit every section, every corner, every heart, and I banish that spirit of discouragement, that spirit of doubt, in the name of Jesus. In the example that Pastor James cited, that enterprise was planning to expand. It aims to grow profit or productivity. That's why they're expanding. They want to grow their network. But James says there's a dependency. That's because the markets are so dynamic that no consultant can predict to the width of certainty what will happen tomorrow. Just like Nigeria, nobody knows who will win this election. Therefore, your corporate strategy must not be presumptuous. You know, when consultants talk, they talk as if business and God don't mingle. Whereas the person that controls reality, the person that controls the operating environment, is not the government, it's the sovereign power, God Almighty. It is important, therefore, to do worst case analysis and, where necessary, place in, put in place a contingency plan like those seven virgins. Most importantly, as a Christian businessman, even if you are not a Christian, recognize the sovereignty of God in business. Now, the problem with young men is that give a young man a very fine car, a yellow babe, you know, and, and, and some nice clothes, and he loses his head. The reason God does not give you some of the things that you're asking for is because he would rather not lose you. And until he's taking you through a school, until you've learned, Sometimes you fail, sometimes you do receipt. It keeps on giving you receipt until you learn how to handle wealth. There are people who can't handle wealth, but are praying for wealth. I remember the first set of Christians who went into the finance world. Almost all of them went into jail because they couldn't handle money. 
they were not prepared for the amount of money that they had. I remember a young man who kept on boasting that his BMW can never break, break down. Because the BMW will warn you that it's about to break down. So he began to boast that the BMW 3 Series was incapable of breaking down. I mean, that's just 3 Series. What if you had Z7 Series? What are you going to do? You are going to fly. What about personal vision? We've seen an example of corporate vision. What about personal vision? Well, the Bible does talk about personal vision. There's a man in the Bible called Jacob. When he had, you know, swamped his uh, brother, he went into exile, ran away to his uncle's place. And as he was going, he made a vow to God at Bethel and said, God, if you, let me read it, if God stands by me and protects me on this journey on which I'm setting out, keeps me in food and clothing, brings me back in one piece to my father's house, this God will be my God, and everything you give me, I'll return one thing to you. So at this point, he was thinking existentially. Notice that all he was talking about was survival. And that's the way we are. When you start the life as a young man, you are thinking survival. At a point, however, you need to switch your brain and no longer start thinking of survival, but corporate survival. So at some point, our friend Jacob decided he wanted to be a corporation. So he went to his uncle, whom he had served for 14 years in managerial capacity, and told the uncle, I want to start my business. Give me venture capital. And the uncle, you've never seen anybody as crooked as Laban. He was as crooked as a snake in convulsion. His uncle snook at him. So they agreed. Laban will keep all the neutral pallets, all the goats that have neutral panel, pallet. So if you are gray or white or brown or anything, it belongs to Laban. However, if you are black or spotted, you belong to Jacob. So our friend Laban went the night before the exercise and removed all the goats that were black and spotted. Essentially, this guy had served him for 14 years and he was giving him zero in venture capital. Now, I want to point out a very important principle to you. What the Bible says is that Jacob knew that when the animals were in heat, they came to drink. Now, we don't know why, but that's what the Bible says. So what Jacob did was to take poplar tree and he carved into the tree Adidas stripes. So he called it, you know, Adidas stripes. You know, uh, Nike had not yet started, so it was Adidas. Now, I want you to see something. Two principles. Anytime the animals were in heat and there's visualization, they gave back to what they were looking at. Do you understand? It's a principle that even God used for us. It's the same principle that God used for Abraham. Two things. The ability to attain your vision is based on two principles. You must have fervent desire. Number one. Number two. You must be visualizing what gives birth to your vision. Fervent desire, visualization. Now, if you notice, every time God went to Abraham, he gave him a visualizing exercise. So he would tell him that, look at the Milky Way galaxy. As tell him to count the stars. Now, we do know that there are over 400 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So God is telling Abraham to start counting a numeric system that did not even exist at the time he was alive. 400 billion stars was the promise of God to Abraham. But he noticed something. Every time his passion was dwindling, God would go to him and reply him and tell him that his promise is still alive. In other words, as the promise was cooling down, the desire was cooling down, God was jacking it up. 
And he kept on doing it until that promise came. And the lowest point was when Ishmael was born. At that point, Abraham had given up, which was why he told God that please spare Ishmael. So the dream had gone down, the temperature had gone down, and God fired it up by saying there's a difference between children and sons. Ishmael is the firstborn, but Isaac is the first son. And God deals in sons, he doesn't deal in children. That is why if you check your family, you're going to find that there's an individual that says he may not be the firstborn, he may even be the lastborn. You may be one of the persons that I'm talking about. You find that your family relates to you as if you are the progenitor of the family. You are the son, you are not the child. So everybody looks up to you. Now some of you complain, especially the women, I'm the one taking care of everybody. I'm the one taking care of everybody. Why is everybody depending on me? Everybody is asking me for money. Those are the responsibilities of sonship. Stop complaining. I have a friend. She's rich and all that. And she said, if only I can just get a man who will take care of me. I told her, forget it. I said, why do you think God has been training you this way all the while? Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to have understanding. Visualization, fervency. I remember I was living in Ikeja, Ogba. As a young man, I was 20-something at this time. And I wanted to live in GRA, Ikeja. Because I felt that GRA conformed more to scriptures. My people shall live in quiet and dwelling places, in quiet and peaceable habitations. Very scriptural. <laughs> Low density, peace, vegetation, good roads. I wanted that. But there was no way a young man could get there from where I was. It's not possible. So what will I do? Almost every day, I would drive to GRA and just be driving around. Just be driving around, taking it in. I was looking at my Adidas stripes. And I kept on driving and driving and driving. And then I fell ill. I was in the hospital for three months. I moved, and there's a reason I gave you that information, to show you that it's not the fact that I had strength, that the miracle still happened, irrespective of the fact that I had no strength. And I was in hospital. I moved straight from hospital to GRA. Do you get what I'm saying? You need to have a vision board. Look, the reason people don't succeed sometimes is based on what they are looking at. Because what you focus upon is what you reproduce. If perchance you use your energy and your strength and your passion to stare at something that will not be a vision for you, should not be vision for you, you are going to give back to it. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why Nigerians paint their houses yellow ochre and brown? Has, has anybody ever wondered? That's the most popular color in Nigeria, yellow ochre and brown. Exactly like our brother. Have you ever wondered why? Now, I used to think that they were trying to hide debt. But then I said, if you are trying to hide debt, why paint your house yellow? So they are not trying to hide debt. And then I began to cogitate and began to cogitate. And I discovered that those colors were NTA logo colors. They had stared, that generation stared at NTA logo at least two hours a day for years, and they reproduced brown and yellow color. Notice something. The new generation, they don't paint their houses yellow and brown. 
Have you noticed? They usually paint their houses white because they don't look at NTA. They watch other things on YouTube, California houses, which are usually white, in and out configuration. So they build houses like that. But the people that were selling at NTA logo for two hours a day for two years were painting the houses white and brown and yellow. This is a real thing I'm telling you. Sometimes the principle of mediocrity that is in the lives of people came from MTA. Because it's the same machines, it's the same camera with BBC, yet the quality of our programming is nonsense. Because there's a spirit of mediocrity. So watch what you pay attention to. I made up my mind that I will not dignify poverty. I began to look at things that important people look at. So if you are here, instead of buying proper artwork, you bought the artwork, an artwork, you know that velvet artwork, black velvet, with pan wine tapa, you've been selling at NTA. If you have certain types of curtains in your house, you know those viscous curtains that they sell at Yaba, you've been selling at NTA. Nigerian Television Authority. I'm not kidding. Let's look at the question of purpose, and this is where it gets complicated. The difference between vision and purpose is that with vision, it's about you. God has no problem with that. Jacob had a vision. Those guys that James was talking about, they had a vision. They wanted to expand their business. Nothing wrong. God has no problem whatsoever with you having vision. And the vision has to be expansive. If it is something that you can easily do, it is not vision. And then you meet people and they say, you know, I've defined a perpetual vision. There is nothing like a perpetual vision. Walmart Corporation, in 19, let me see, 19, I think 1999 or so. Let me check my data. Okay. In 1999, I don't know if you know Walmart. Those of you that travel will know, but Walmart is a bloody supermarket. Their vision was to become, in 1999, a $125 billion company by the year 2000. They attained it and then changed the vision. The essence of vision is attainment. You understand? If you are running a company, the purpose of vision is not something you hang in the reception or you put in your annual report. That's not the purpose of vision, unless you put it there so that you can be selling at it. Even the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain, so that people who read it can run with it. So the purpose of vision is attainment. And once you fulfill that vision, set another vision, a bigger vision. If it's something that you can easily do, it is not vision. Now let's go to purpose. Purpose is a big question in philosophy. And so I'm going to try and tackle it a bit philosophically. Now what people, Christians don't like the word philosophy. They think it's secular or carnal or something that is unbiblical and all that. So and I'm wondering, why do you think God put the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible? There are four culture books in the Bible. Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and, this, and um, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and... Um, Song of Song is the fine girl one, right? Yeah, okay. So Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Those are the four culture books. Now the reason that God put culture books in the Bible is so that you can be a rounded individual. Because remember, the anointing that you have is both secular and, and spiritual. Now, so there are Christians that are so spiritual, they can't function in the corporate world. That is an anomaly. That is wrong. That is not the vision of God. 
You know, I went to my university and I saw some young girls in the choir and I saw the way they were dressed. I don't want to address the particulars of their dressing. And I could tell how far these kids would go in life. Because if you are not cultured, your corporation will be afraid of sending you to represent them in foreign climes. Therefore, you determine your career before it has even started. You know, people, I was explaining to Pastor Nee before we came for the program, that people confuse. Oh God, I, I don't want to go into it. We, we won't leave this place. We won't leave this place. Christians are always trying to spiritualize the Song of Songs. You are not supposed to spiritualize it because, I mean, how spiritual can you grow when God mentions breasts? It has a purpose. It is for you to be able to do with the relational component of your success. Because the price of success is not divorce. The price of success is not divorce. You are supposed to be successful and be successfully married. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you don't do the right things that are needed, say your wife wants to buy you something, because you need to understand the language of women. If I want to buy, please come forward. Assuming that you want to buy me something for my birthday, just imagine that I'm your boyfriend or something, okay? Now, Mrs. Alda, please, it's just illustration. Okay? Now, if you give me a gift and I reject it, how do you feel? Why are you even rejecting my gift? You have started argument. <laughs> and God help you if she never vocalized what she just said now. But how does it make you feel if I say, no, I don't want? Bad, obviously. You feel rejected? I feel bad. You feel bad. Now, those of you that are making your wives feel bad, you don't know why. It's because you don't understand the code of women. Women say more by not saying anything. Do you understand? You can go, please. Please give a round of applause. You need to study the subtle nuances in the complexion of your wife. Because it means something. You know, when God deals with me, and I was studying how God speaks to me, and I realized that you just flush my heart with something. I can't define what it is, but I can interpret it. And it's just a flush that lasts one thousandth of a second, but in that one flush are like hundred statements. Women are like that. And when you, ref and you don't, first of all, women like good things. Don't say they are carnal. Don't say they are material. It is okay to be materialistic as a woman. So don't say it is a thought that counts. That's a bad thought. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to save somebody's marriage to say. Okay? Let, let's, let's move on fast. Let's, let's, um... When you don't have or understand the concept of purpose, you become a bigata. You know big data, sir? Let me read for you a big data. Genesis 4, 18. And to Enoch was born Erat. And Erat begat Mehujael. And Mehujael began Methusael. And Methusael begat Lamech. So those are the big gatas. Your sole function on that is biological. You are just a biological staple pin linking one generation to the next generation. Otherwise, your life is useless. You need to find purpose. Now it will seem in scriptures, and, and this is where it gets deep, that there are two categories of purpose individuals in the Bible. There are those that are purpose for God by God for religious ends, people like Pastor Jude. And there are those that are purpose by God for political means. Those are the two classes of purpose that I find in scriptures either religious 
or political. Now, if you study and you find a third dimension, please tell me. But it's both religious. What I've studied and what I've found is that it's both religious and political. Now, listen to me. When it comes to political purposing, faith is irrelevant. So God will purpose a believer and an unbeliever. So for example, he purposed Nebuchadnezzar to punish the Israelites. Then he purposed Cyrus the Great to bring them back to the promised land. Both of them were unbelievers. Indeed, God himself said that Cyrus does not know him. You got to ascend in your thinking to understand how God thinks. So in our religiosity, we cannot imagine a God who will purpose an unbeliever. God can favor a believer, but when it comes to purposing, he purposes both believers and unbelievers. This is what he said as for Cyrus. I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not know me. Neither do you acknowledge me. So Nebuchadnezzar carried the Jews into exile to in fulfillment of a prophecy. Seventy years later, Cyrus returned them from exile in fulfillment of prophecy. That God can use a non-believer for his purpose is a theological challenge for many Christians. And I know I'm stepping into areas that people don't want to hear. But you better listen to what God says. You better take God at face value. God is a sovereign authority. He rules over all creation. The problem that we have is our conception of God. We have conceived a moral God rather than a righteous God. There's a difference between righteousness and morality. When you talk to a Christian, he will tell you that he's righteous because God has given him righteous, made him righteous. Pastor Neil, what is that phrase that we use? About righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And then we define righteousness as what? Right standing with God. Now, please come out again. Give me time more. <laughs> See, I am God, he is man. Okay? When he wants to define righteousness, he says he's standing right with God and therefore is righteous. But that is not the definition of righteousness. He cannot stand right with God unless he was a sinner. And if man is righteous, and God is righteous, God cannot be standing right with himself because God is not a sinner. Am I making sense to you? You are not getting it. You are. Therefore, righteous, right standing with God is the result of righteousness. It is not the definition of righteousness. Are you going with me? Let me explain. The difference between morality and righteousness is that I need five people. Five. Please come out quickly. Please just come out quickly. You are men now, please. One more. Okay, I want you to queue and face this direction. Pastor Jude, please stand here. All the gifts. Okay, so queue with them. Queue with them. Queue with them. Okay. Now, these people have been keen for the past 20 years. They want to get that thing from Pastor Jude. Pastor Kara, please come. Now, remember, I'm God, right? So, this man, just come along. What year are you? You've been keen since 1940. Okay. You, you are 1986. Now, this man that I'm holding, 
is 2020. That's when they started asking for the same thing. So it kills here, which is what we do, because we say that we are not worthy of God's grace. So God says, come along, you have my son, makes him shunt everybody, and gives him the price. And then these guys begin to complain, I have been king since 1940. What does the Christian call this? Favor. Is it moral? It's not moral because he just joined the queue. But is it righteous? It is righteous because God did it. Are you flowing with me? Because God did it. Because the concept of righteousness is anchored in sovereignty. Are you flowing with me? He is God. Nobody can question him. Nobody can sit him down to ask him why he did what he did. Nobody. It's a sovereign power. It's a sovereign authority. That's what Paul was writing about when he said, Who are you, O pot, clay, to demand from the potter what he's making? You have no constitutional right because sovereignty is God's constitutional right. And in his sovereignty, he decided that he will save us, the sons of Abraham, rather than angels who have been on the queue. Isn't that what Hebrews tells you? Therefore, you need to understand righteousness and stop judging God by your morality. Morality is an aggregator of behavior in society. And morality of man changes regularly. Just a few years ago, a man couldn't marry a man. Today, a man can marry a man. Now, which is the morality that God should follow? Do you understand? So what he does, he wants you to understand sovereignty. He wants you to understand righteousness. So when he tells you that I have made you my righteousness, it is backed with supreme authority. It is that power, that authority, that makes him say that if a man's ways please the Lord, he does what? If he does what? No, I want one word. He does what? Makes. He's not going to persuade them. He just shows up, makes them an offer they can't refuse. Original mafia stuff. Are you flowing with me? The other use of the word righteousness in the Bible is as a brand stylism. So if God were to set up a royal mill, he won't call it royal mill like the Queen of England, he'll call it righteous mill. If he wants to set up transportation, he'll call it righteous transport. So everything God does is transport. Everything is righteous because that is his brand stylism. But beyond that is the constitutional principle by which he safeguards your rights. And it is that right that Jesus pleads in heaven and stands before God, before your accuser, the devil, who keeps on accusing you of everything that you agree with and you're accusing yourself with. But Jesus says, according to section one of the constitutional rights of God, God, this guy is righteous, therefore he can never be guilty. Do you understand me? It's not something you do. Righteousness in the Old Testament was something that you do. In the New Testament, righteousness is a noun. It is something you are. Are you flowing with me? Therefore, when you face the adversary, it will remind you of precedence, as if it's a lawyer. It will tell you that on July so, so, and so, and so, you did something. On January so, so, and so, you did something. He is not lying. The devil doesn't always tell lies. He tells the truth sometimes. But when he lies to you or when he tells you the truth, it says that you can believe a lie. So you believe those things about yourself and you're unable to access the constitutional principle called righteousness. And righteousness is a weapon that God uses. And the reason that you know that righteousness is different from morality is because God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, even before the children were born. 
Therefore, the righteousness of Jacob was not based on anything that he did, if at all, he is the most undeserving person that you can ever imagine. But God is a sentimental God. When he saved us, it was not because of any logic, it was not because of any reason. It is because he loves us. God is a sentimental God. Jesus died for love. He died on sentiments. Am I making sense to you? Am I making sense to you? Is there somebody who understands righteousness tonight? Please go to your seats. Thank you. The problem, and if there's nothing you gain from this message tonight, listen to what I'm about to say. I'm off, I'm off course now, and I'm on fire. The problem is that we have a religious prism of God. When you talk to people about God, they said it's God the Father. They don't know that the term Father is a political title. That is why Jesus is also referred to as everlasting Father in the book of Isaiah. It is a title, political title. God is a political figure. He is not a religious figure. He has a day job. On Monday, he administers creation and all of heaven and all of earth. He runs a government. That is his job. We are not going to be doing church in heaven. That's not the only reason we are going to heaven. I'm not saying you won't go to church in heaven. That's not what I'm saying. When the Bible says that the 20 and 4 elders cast down their crowns and worship God, the reason they cast down their crowns is because those people are political figures or else they will not have crowns. Am I making sense to you? Now, let me, let me say something that is very controversial but which is true if you examine what I'm saying. When we come to church on Sunday, you think that you are coming for a religious service. But it is not a religious service. It's a governmental assembly. And that is why Satan can come. Because he's a delegate, he's a political figure. Remember he went for a conference in heaven, United Nations Conference? Remember? And like America and Russia, though they don't see eye to eye, but they talk. There's what we call back channel system. So Satan was able to secure a meeting with God at the UN Confederation in heaven, the conference he went for, because he's a political figure. And Satan is fanatically focused on government. Look at his organogram. Principalities, powers, rulers. What is more blatantly political than that? A principality is a space that is governed by a prince. Power, rulers, that's his organogram. Now notice something. Witches and wizards don't function on that organogram. In other words, they are like plasma. And most of you spend your time fighting witches and wizards. They are not, they are not stuff for you. Am I making sense? So when we come to church on Sunday, I want to tell you something now. The reason we do praise worship is not because we need to worship God. We do praise worship because God is a monarch. He's a king. That's his form of government. He runs a monarchy. And you oblate and genuflect before monarchy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if God were a president, you would not do praise worship in church. We will all stand up. Pastor Jules will announce, please stand up for the head of state to come in. We will stand up. We will sing the national anthem. God will sit on the days and tell all of us, sit down. But because it's monarchy, you have to worship him. You have to oblate him. Once you do that, you declare the session open. Have you ever wondered why we're able to make decrease in church and it comes to pass? Decrease at governmental decrease. They are not religious principles. A decree is what a military government does. So when we come to church, if we understand what church is, if we understand what church is, you will not come to church anyhow. You will not come to church without a purpose. Because the king must hear what you have to say. And once he grants it in church, nothing can change it. 
So you come to church on Sunday as a political delegate. Do you understand? It's a general assembly where there's power and authority. God is present, the angels are present, the witches are present, Satan is present because the Bible says that unto them has been granted to know the manifold wisdom of the principles of God which happens in church every Sunday. So God marches in. If we know what we are doing on Sunday, any nation, any nation, and not just Nigeria, we will turn it around. You see, religion is a terrible thing. When you read your, your, your Bible, Old Testament, you describe that there are two types of prophets. There are what you call the international relations prophets, and then there are the local prophets, the national prophets. Isaiah, Zechariah, and I think Ezekiel are the international relations prophets. Go and read their prophecies. They were talking about nations, not necessarily Israel. In other words, on Sunday, we can stand here and decree what will happen in Gabon, what will happen in Senegal, what will happen in Cameroon, what will happen in Ghana. Because there's a reason that God drew all of us from different nations and countries and different tribes and entities. The people that are the problem of Nigeria are the Christians. It's not the politicians. Because you're a political delegate. We are put with him. There was a special jail for political prisoners. The baker and the, what's the name of the other guy? The cop bearer. They were political prisoners. So they were put in DSS office. But the reason God wanted Joseph to serve those guys was so that he would learn how to address Pharaoh. Because when you study the Bible, Pharaoh is addressed in the third person. So as if he's not in the room. So if I'm talking about Pastor Kamela now, say, Pastor Kamela is here. And I'm talking to him. Pastor Kamela, I'm going to give you your phone. As if he's not here. So they talk to him in the third person. So by the time it was time for Joseph to relate to Pharaoh, he already knew how to address nobility. Do you understand? Therefore, your trial is a school. Then some of you misinterpret the dreams. Let me give you an example. Joseph dreamt that the sun, the moon, and the stars will worship him. Isn't that so? Does anybody have a different version? Who was the sun? The father. Who was the moon? Who was the, who the stars? Okay. Did his mother worship him? Therefore, the moon cannot be the mother. Because the dream came to pass. The sun, the moon, and the stars worshipped Joseph. The mother had died before the dream came to pass. Therefore, the moon cannot be his mother. Am I making sense to you? So the question then is, what is the sun, what is the moon, what are the stars? It was pointing to Egypt. They were worshipping the sun god, the moon god, and the stars. So what God was saying was that he was going to subject the authority, the sovereignty, and the political sagacity of Egypt onto the bottom, under the edge of Joseph. He was going to make him king over them. Am I making sense to you? Stop misinterpreting dreams. Let God interpret the dreams for you. The actualization will interpret the dream. That is why purpose is discovered. Vision is engineered. When it came to the end, Joseph said, you sent me here for this purpose. And I'm telling you at this time, Mrs. Potiphar had bought a British Airways ticket and had gone on break. You sent me here thinking you were killing me. But God sent me here to present, to, to protect the, preserve the nascent nation of Israel. It was all a political game. What am I trying to say? We are general managers in our bank and we promote ourselves out of, we become pastors, not knowing that there are political roles for us to play. Nigeria is not in short of pastors. What we are in short of are in short of the Moseses of this world, the Mandelas of this world, and the political activists of this world. Think twice about your purpose. I want to round up now.
I'm really sorry. I, I, I downloaded this stuff and, and I worked very hard on it. Oh God, help me. I need to say this. You know, I was very happy when Pastor Kamila went into politics. And the reason I was happy was because Christians don't understand government. You know, Christians focus on governance, they don't focus on politics. And politics always overwhelms policy. I just want to make sure I'm saying what God wants me to say. We set up Bible training schools, but we don't set up government schools. Because we believe that what we teach in church will solve poverty. So we teach the principle of the seed principle. But Jesus already told us that the efficiency ratio of the seed principle is one to four. Some will fall on shallow ground, some will fall on gravel, some will fall among thorns, but only one quarter will fall on good ground. In other words, even if we are all perfect, the efficiency ratio of the things that we teach as per prosperity, only 25% of these people in this congregation today will, have, will get it. And the reason is simple. Some don't have money, some don't believe the pastor, some are struggling with other thoughts, and therefore, only a few get it. And even those that get it, they are waiting for 20 years to actualize the fullness of that thing. There are things that only policy can solve. When there's industrial scale poverty in a nation, what you need is industrial scale policy. There are things that are created by government. The parable of the seed principle is not going to solve inflation. It's not going to solve the movement of the Naira. It's not going to solve its devaluation. Therefore, when you go into government, you are in a better position to use the governmental authority of government, the authority of government to solve poverty problems. Because the seed principle has an inefficiency built in. It is okay to be a pastor. What I've come to say here tonight is that there are those of you that should be in government. Please go into government. It is not composite you become a pastor. If you are meant to be a pastor, you will have known by now. Did you get me? You will have known by now. If you are 50 and you are still wondering, are you a pastor? Chances are that you are not. I'm saying that the church needs to start anointing people to go into the governmental space so that we can solve the monumental poverty problem that we have. At the rate at which we are multiplying poverty, it can never be enough whatever we produce. And people don't know it. I've consulted. I consult a lot for politics. The lack of education, focus on education, is a deliberate policy. I remember I was with a former head of state and I was going to initiate a school program that every Nigerian must go to primary school. And a minister walked up to him, a minister from a certain region of the country, and said to him, if you educate everybody, who will be the servants? Those are the people you are dealing with. I want to thank you for listening. God bless you.